In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Veni, Sancte Spiritus, repletuorum, corda fidelium, et tui amoris in eis inima cende, mite spiritum et tuum et creabuntur. Oremus Deus, qui corda fidelium, Sancte Spiritus, et tuus razzini docuisti, da nobis in iodem, spiritu recta sapere, et re eius, semper consolatini godere, per Christum Dominum nostrum. Sede sapiensie, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today we begin our study of the reign of the last true pope to date, of course, uh, which uh, really belongs to the seventh section of church history. The only difficulty being that uh, the reason why we didn't cover it last year, uh, being on account of the fact that that being the last, it also gets pushed to the end of the year, and as you get, especially with last year, as you get towards the end of the year, we have fewer and fewer available class periods. So in order to really do this reign justice, which is really indispensable for understanding our current situation, we decided to do it at the beginning of this year. So despite the fact that the schedule says church history one, this really does belong to the seventh section, chronologically, of course. Uh, but this may become routine in the future to do it this way. But this is indeed the uh, study of the reign of Pope Pius XII, uh, a reign which is, of course, remembered with uh, a great deal of, of fondness, looked back upon even by many who, uh, of course, were born long after it with a degree of fondness, and even a, a, de a great degree of fondness, and not without reason. Uh, in many ways, the church did flourish during the reign of Pius XII. That cannot be denied. Um, seminaries, uh, religious houses were full to overflowing. Uh, parishes were enormous. You can see in the picture that we have the photograph on the, on the, in the second floor, right, just inside the, the entrance there, of those ordinations taking place in St. Patrick's Cathedral could count how many dozens of ordinances there were and how that, that the cathedral was obviously packed with people attending the ordinations then. If, if you notice also, if you look closely enough, you'll see that that was actually a low mass that which uh, those ordinations were being conferred. That was routinely done prior to Vatican II because there were so many ordinations that, well, if you've ever seen an ordination ceremony, you know it takes a while even just to do a few, a few ordinations. So in order to do that many, in order to have the ceremony done before the end of the day, it was necessary to do that ceremony as a low mass. So that is just one indication of the way in which the, the reign of the church indeed flourished during, uh, or dur that the state of the church was indeed flourishing during the reign of Pius XII. There, there, in certain ways, that was definitely the case. Um, and also, just uh, start out by mentioning now certain things that we will not be covering, uh, or at least um, uh, very little might, things we might touch upon, things that cannot, we cannot uh, avoid entirely, but uh, things that uh, we will not definitely, we will definitely not be focusing on um, are, in fact, the things which most books on the reign of Pius XII focus on. World War II, what did, did he do enough or not concerning the Jews and so on and so forth, that's most of it. And there's very little that's actually ever been written in books focusing on Pius XII himself on the way he actually reigned over the church. How were things actually managed during his reign? 
there seems to be very little written on that point expressly. You can find the information. Uh, but it's mostly, you have, to, you have to get to it in other ways, uh, in books on other topics, uh, in books uh, about other people who came up during his reign. And as we said, yes, there, there was definitely a great degree of, or a great deal of flourishing in the church during his reign, but we also, there are certain things that we have to consider. For example, how is it that, well, Pius XII, as you can see from your notes, died in 1958, how is it that just seven years later, in 1965, Vatican II was promulgated? And just 10 years later, 1968, the invalid Novus Ordo Episcopal consecrations were promulgated. And then 11 years after his death, 1969, the Novus Ordo Missae was promulgated. And so on and so forth. Count all of the, all of the uh, things promulgated as part of the beginning of the Vatican II religion, all of that happened just very quickly after his death. How is that possible? That's something else we have to consider. Now, certainly Pius XII did not intend any of that to happen. There's no question of that. He was always perfectly orthodox himself, obviously only intended the good of the church. But we do have to consider, uh, does he bear any degree of responsibility for what happened so shortly after he died. And we'll have to see, that, yes, there are certain things that must be laid at his feet. And as, as much as, of course, we, have, we revere the papacy, uh, it is indeed possible for popes to make poor uh, decisions, decisions that are poor from the point of view of prudence, or it's possible for a pope to be a poor judge of character. And we'll have to see to what degree any of that may or may not apply to Pius XII. Uh, we will have to see, we'll have to look at all of the people who did bring about Vatican II, how they came up during his reign. They, they very, definitely, they did so, and that cannot be denied. And we'll have to compare also what happened to those characters during the reign of St. Pius X, and the way that they viewed St. Pius X as opposed to the way they viewed other popes, including Pius XII himself. And the short version of that, we'll see it in detail, but the short version of that is that they complained endlessly about St. Pius X, but not about any of the others. Nobody complained about Leo XIII, who came before St. Pius X, and they definitely didn't complain about Benedict XV, or Pius XI, nor Pius XII. But they complained about St. Pius X. So, we'll have to see. Now, again, all of that, all this is just a preview of what we'll be looking at. So, uh, looking at the reign of Pope Pius XII, which extended nearly 20 years, 1939 to 1958. First, we'll look at some of his family background. Uh, Eugenio Pacelli was born March 2nd, 1876, at the end of the reign of Pope Pius IX. So, anybody who was here during the uh, section of church history in which we covered the reign of Pope Pius IX, you remember that it's it was indeed, as it is characterized in the notes, as being long, troubled, and turbulent. For one thing, long, yes, from 1846 to 1878, a very long reign, uh, during which a tremendous amount of trouble was caused for the church. Even very early on, in the first few years of his reign, the revolutions of 1848 shook Europe, uh, shook the city of Rome itself, and we'll see this uh, shortly, which uh, you may have seen already from looking ahead in the notes, uh, the, the, that caused Pius IX to have to flee the city of Rome itself. He had to, uh, we'll get into that in a little bit, but he had to flee dressed as a simple priest because he was in serious physical danger due to the revolutionaries and what they were doing in Rome itself uh, in 1848. So, the, uh, yes, there are a tremendous number of misfortunes befell the church in the, during the reign of Pius IX. And uh, he did his utmost to oppose all of it, at least after a certain point he did. Uh, but this is not actually a study of the reign of Pius IX, but we will have to touch upon certain things uh, that occurred during that reign because uh, his family, the, the, the background, the family background of Pope Pius XII, uh, uh, had, uh, had a great deal of involvement with the papacy, even long before the birth of, of Eugenio Pacelli himself. 
So uh, you see here that Pius IX indeed sought and sought unsuccessfully to preserve the papacy's temporal power by resisting his states, and not, not, this is not his personal state, we're talking about the papal states, absorption into a unified Italy. A unified Italy, which to this day is a joke. And Italians themselves don't have any, uh, have any kind of uh, loyalty, generally speaking, to the state of Italy, uh, to the Italian now it's republic. At the time, kingdom. It was forged from various different states, including the papal states. And uh, but we'll get into that a little bit more, but indeed Pius IX opposed that, sought support from the Catholic nations of Europe, who were indeed still Catholic nations, uh, to oppose the loss of the papal states to the, uh, to the left, far left agenda of the day, but ultimately that didn't work out. So the, uh, despite his intransigent opposition to the Risorgimento and his restoration following the revolutionary upheaval of 1848 to 1849, this pope, meaning Pius IX, proved unable to prevent the loss of most of his state during the unification of the peninsula. So the Apennine Peninsula, meaning uh, the forging of most of these small Italian states into the nation of Italy that we see today. So it was done in degrees, by degrees. Uh, you may know that uh, the fall of Rome itself to these revolutionaries only happened in 1870, but it was as early as 1861 that the Kingdom of Italy was proclaimed. And that was something of which, of course, uh, Pius IX very greatly disapproved, as did, of course, all, all devout Catholics, all good Catholics who did not want to see the Papal States lost. But the Papal States were not lost all at once, not all at the same time. They were taken over gradually, by degrees, uh, bit by bit, piece by piece, until nothing was left. So, uh, ultimately, uh, you see in the next paragraph, he was, nor was he, Pius IX, able to retain even a remnant of the papal state or preserve his temporal power to any degree at all after Rome was seized by the Sardinians in 1870. So, Sardinians, that's the, uh, the, the, the Piedmontese, in other words. Uh, the, the naming of different states, uh, pre-unified Italy uh, states, uh, can be rather confusing. For example, you have the mention of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. That means Sicily and Naples. Somehow Naples uh, became Sicily number two. Uh, or Sardinia, you think, isn't that, is that not the island, uh, or one of those two islands uh, that is uh, off the coast of Italy and, and the Mediterranean Sea? And yes, somehow, yeah, uh, not, that, that doesn't concern us here, but somehow that name, Sardinia, came to be connected with uh, the, the Duchy of Savoy in northern Italy, whose capital is in Turin. And it was indeed, yes, they, they the Turin government, uh, headed by the Freemason King Victor Emmanuel III, who became king of Italy, Victor Emmanuel III, that spearheaded the takeover of the Papal States. And it was just the perfectly Masonic agenda of the day. And all of this, uh, keep in mind, was not unique to Italy was not unique even to Europe. This was a worldwide trend in the mid-19th century to solidify different uh, areas that had been perhaps either, either unified nations in some cases or at least where central control had not been very strong and making those areas into these monolithic nation states controlled from one central place uh, without, without question. And so it was everywhere. Again, we said in, in Italy itself, you had all of these different states. Uh, the Kingdom of Naples was one of those, as we mentioned, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, uh, the, uh, the Duchy of Savoy further north, the Papal States themselves. All of that was the region of Italy for a long, long time, many centuries. And it was only in, yes, in the mid-19th century that, that all that finally became the state of Italy. Uh, there also... Germany was united in the mid-19th century. Uh, for a long time, uh, Germany was similarly a region. Yes, there were certain German states that became quite powerful. Austria, for example, as you can see on the map over there, had its formed its whole, this whole huge empire. 
uh, that was really Austria was just one of many different German states that happened to acquire a lot of territory through marriages mostly, but that really doesn't concern us right now in the history of Austria at this moment. Uh, but uh, Austria, very powerful. Prussia, very powerful as well, uh, known, of course, for its uh, military prowess. Napoleon said that Prussia was hatched from a cannonball. So that's, uh, that, was, that was the degree to which even Napoleon recognized that Prussia was very militaristic. But also, in, in the mid-19th century, uh, the unification of Germany to forge the German Empire that you see on the map over there. Um, you know, Prussia spearheaded that. And in fact, during the same decade, the 1860s, there was a short war between Prussia and Austria, which had no other purpose other than to see who would become the leader of a unified Germany. And Prussia won that war and so became the leader of unified Germany. And that gave rise to the, uh, the causes of the First World War. Uh, even outside of Europe, uh, Japan modernized itself in the 19th century uh, and became um, a, a nation state. Uh, well, perhaps it was already before, but uh, became, it, def it definitely modernized itself according to uh, the standards of, of the West in many ways. And then in North America, also the American Civil War was really that a war fought over centralization, uh, that, uh, that the South of the uh, many different states, formerly a part of the Union, wanted to secede from the Union and form its own nation. That was very much against the trend of the time, which was one of centralization. So, at the, but you know, notice that in all of these conflicts, the centralizing power is always the one that wins out. That there was a tremendous force at the time to put down any other tendencies, any other desires. So the, you know, the, ultimately, the, the South lost uh, the U.S. Civil War because it couldn't get uh, um, foreign recognition, uh, foreign support. Uh, that was their first best chance to, for the South to win its independence. Uh, in Italy, you know, ultimately, the Papal States were lost because the Catholic nations of Europe would not support Pius IX in retaining the Papal States. And there was allowed to happen to a very great extent. And so this is, you know, looking at the, the general trend of the time, as a result, Pio Nono's long pontificate would have a profound influence on Eugenio's grandfather, Marc Antonio, his father, Filippo, and Eugenio and his brother, Francesco. So we see, in the middle of all of this, none of them, certainly none of them liked this, this uh, forging these nation states, which I've mentioned it before, but it's interesting to note that that was the far left agenda of the mid 19th century: was to forge these nation states and make them into vehicles of the revolution. Of course, nowadays conservatives plant their flags, both literally and and figuratively, on nation states, uh, because uh, the far left agenda of today is to get rid of those nation states because they've outlived their usefulness as. Uh, vehicles of revolution. They have, they have better ways of, of doing that now than they have. They want to bring things to the next step. So the idea of the left now is to do away with nation state. That's, all of that enters into uh, much wider topics, which we're not getting into now. But all of them, so Marc Antonio Pacelli, uh, Pius XII's grandfather, uh, Filippo Pacelli, his father, and his older brother Francesco, certainly none of them, and of course Eugenio himself, none of them liked this centralizing trend of the left in the 19th century or in 20th century, early 20th century. But it's all a question of how do they deal with it? And we'll see that each of them dealt with it, reacted to it in different ways. So uh, it appears, according to the author from which I took these notes, that the disasters that befell the church during this time of intransigence in papal policy was one of the factors that played a part in moving the young impressionable, uh, sensitive boy Eugenio to shun intransigence for accommodation, which he found useful in childhood and beyond. So here we get to the theme of the pendulating papacy, as it's sometimes called, going back and forth between two factions, effectively. Of course, there are no political parties in the Catholic Church, but there can be different schools of thought 
different uh, groups of people who have different ideas as to how to deal with things. And here we get into the distinction between the, the politicanti and the zelanti. Uh, the politicanti being the ones who wanted to accommodate, get, grant, grant as many concessions to the modern world, to, to put it simply, as possible in order to gain as good a situation for the church as could possibly be managed. And the Delanti were of the, uh, the school of thought that, no, stand fast, uh, hold on to the rights of the church, let come what may, the church will survive. Every regime that causes trouble for the church will pass. Every heresy that arises to cause trouble for the church will disintegrate. Stand firm on the rights of the church in every way, and all will be well, ultimately. And if you notice, it's all of those hardliners, you know, both before and after the beginning of this routine distinction and routine switching back and forth of the papacy from one candidate in one conclave to another. Even before that, you notice that, uh, so far as certain popes are harder than others, it's always the hardliners and the zelanti, whether, you know, whether strictly so-called or perhaps might be looked upon as the forerunners of them in some cases, always the hardliners who end up getting canonized. You know, St. Pius V. Uh, St. Pius X, the last two, most two recent popes to be canonized. And then also, Blessed Innocent XI, in fact, whose painting we have in the chapel upstairs, uh, was very hard on Jansenism during his reign. Um, so there, uh, you know, Pius IX himself, his prior to Vatican II even, uh, his case for canonization was opened. So all of the hardliners are the ones who's, who end up getting canonized, or at least whose cases for canonization are opened because ultimately uh, they end up proving to be correct in the long run. And uh, interesting, it's, it is also interesting that Pius IX should end up in the category of the hardliners because you, know, you, you may know, you may remember if you were here for the course a couple of years ago, covering the reign of Pius IX, that he was initially elected as the softer, as the soft candidate, so to speak. Uh, and he gave very many early indications of pursuing that very much. Uh, but you know, due to the revolutions of 1848, he turned around and became very hard. And we'll see that. We'll, we'll go over some of that now. But Pius XII, in other words, here, what we're, the point we're making here is that Pius XII saw, you know, as, a, as a child, uh, all of the, or he was, he, in, in, in 1878, when Pius IX died, he was only two years old, so he probably did not remember anything at all of the reign of Pius IX. But he certainly lived in the aftermath, so to speak, of the reign of Pius IX. He lived, he grew up during the reign of Leo XIII, uh, who was much softer than, than Pius IX was. Uh, but you see that Pius, uh, Pius XII, here, the young Eugenio Pacelli, saw the, to put it mildly, less than ideal situation under which the church was laboring in Italy as he was growing up and saw that as a result of the pieties of Pius IX. And so that in combination with clearly a natural personal tendency to, to avoid conflict that he uh, ended up, you see how all of that carried over into the papacy of Pius XII. And we'll see that, that he was very soft on many things and many people uh, during his reign, which in retrospect, we can only say that it was unfortunate that he was not much harder. So, uh, this was, uh, as you have noted there, uh, he, this was a trait he acquired in his family long before he entered the religious life or the diplomatic service of the Vatican. And indeed, he was immediately, we'll see that later, but he was immediately launched into the Vatican diplomatic corps. So, of course, diplomats sometimes need to be accommodating, need to grant certain concessions to get what they want. You see, that, that, that was his whole training. So, Eugenio, uh, who was the third child and second son of the lawyer Filippo Pacelli and grandson of Marcantonio of the black, so-called black or papal faction that opposed the Sardinian seizure and annexation of the papal states. So, I should, I should say Eugenio was. So, uh, indeed, yes, there we have this distinction of the, the blacks versus the whites and the grays. We'll, uh, that's, you have that in the notes as well. Uh, but the, this is a distinction, actually, that 
went back many, many centuries. Uh, uh, in the Middle Ages, you have the distinction between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines in Italy. Uh, the Guelphs who were the pro-papal faction in Italy and the Ghibellines who were uh, the party of the Holy Roman Emperor. And there were sometimes clashes between, the, many times in fact, between the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope. Uh, the Holy Roman Empire, of course, originally starting out very well uh, under Charlemagne, but uh, later emperors were not, uh, say, were, were not quite so loyal to the church. Uh, some were, some, some, some emperors were good and very good, but many others were definitely less than that, of course. Emperor Henry IV comes to mind, who was excommunicated a few times by uh, uh, Pope Saint, again, Saint Gregory VII, uh, for reasons that we will not get into now. But uh, that, in other words, many centuries earlier, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines in Italy. And then eventually the Guelphs prevailed over the Ghibellines, but even then the, they divided up, the Guelphs divided up amongst themselves into black versus white. And the black, the black Guelphs were the ones who still supported papal, uh, who were still pro-papal as opposed to the whites. So actually there was one famous white Guelph, does anybody know who it was? In Florence. Yes. Yes, Dante, the author of the, so the Divine Comedy, was a white Guelph. He was anti-papal. So, uh, you know, so this distinction we're looking at here, uh, black versus white, uh, that's, uh, that goes back many centuries. So, in other words, the Pacellis here were very firmly in the black camp. They were very pro-papal. Uh, they opposed the Sardinian seizure and annexation of the papal states. So Eugenio's grandfather, uh, Marc Antonio, served as undersecretary in the Ministry of Finance during the pontificate of Gregory XVI, who reigned from 1831 to 1846, so the immediate predecessor to Pius IX, who was Gregory XVI, was uh, very much a hardliner. Again, he was uh, a Camaldolese monk who managed, who ended up being elected pope. So in other words, he had no, he had no care for diplomacy. He was a monk. <laughs> he didn't have any training in that. Uh, he pursued the interests of the church, and that was that. And uh, see, Marc Antonio Pacelli uh, served as this uh, undersecretary of the Ministry of Finance during that reign, so already in association with a hardline pope. He, uh, Marc Antonio, eventually became an advocate of the Tribunal of the Sacred Rota, which is the highest marriage tribunal in the church. He, Marc Antonio, proved the extent of his dedication to the papacy following the renewal of revolutionary upheaval in Rome at the end of 1848 and the flight of Pope Pius IX and his chief minister, Cardinal Giacomo Antonelli, to Gaeta in the Kingdom of Naples. So, in, in 1848, uh, indeed, the revolution was fermented across Europe. It was clearly, when you study it, uh, which we, it's not our focus right now, but when you study that, that was clearly a coordinated effort all across Europe, in many major cities across Europe. The barricades all came out all at the same time, and uh, riots in the streets, and governments being overthrown, and things like that. And it all happened all at the same time. That doesn't happen by accident. People don't just go out to the store and buy barricades because we'd like to go picketing tomorrow. Uh, this was all clearly coordinated, widely coordinated. And in Rome itself, uh, uh, it happened that the revolutionaries brought a cannon into St. Peter's Square, and a bishop was shot dead at his window, and Pius IX had to flee dressed as a simple priest while a monsignor waited in the room in which he usually spent the morning reading, out, reading the newspaper out loud so that the revolutionaries would think that he was still in the room listening to the, the, the at morning's news being read as he was exiting through uh, um, a back door to get into a carriage that took him incognito, effectively, to Gaeta in the Kingdom of Naples, which was still friendly to the Holy See, in, uh, fleeing, really, Pius IX for his life, because there was a good chance that he would have been killed by the revolutionaries. So that whole thing was... That whole, all the, all, everything that happened in the revolutions of 1848 was uh, a tremendous uh, impulse for Pius IX to change from being, again, the softliner uh, who was elected in, in reaction to Gregory XVI and to becoming very hardline. 
uh, before St. Pius X, probably the hardest pope there had been since the, uh, that, the beginning of that distinction between the Delanti and the Politicanti. So in all of that, uh, Marc Antonio Pacelli, Pius XII's grandfather, accompanied Pius IX. So he's so much is he in favor of Pius IX and Pius IX's uh, hardline policies, or at least uh, the Pope who would become the Pope of all of those hardline policies, that he accompanies him on this flight to Gaeta. Refusing to recognize the Republic of Rome, over which Giuseppe Mazzini presided, and his disciple Giuseppe Garibaldi enforced, both of those people being champion creeps. Uh, Marc Antonio joins the Pope and his acting Secretary of State in exile, serving as Pio Nono's legal and political advisor during the time of trouble and turmoil. So Marc Antonio Pacelli accompanies uh, Pius IX and remains with him in exile uh, for as long as that lasted. Uh, so much is he uh, unwilling to compromise with revolution. Uh, refusing to recognize the Roman Republic. And you may remember, uh, you know, if you were here for the study of the reign of Pius IX, that uh, there were two ideas about the way that Italy should be unified. All of the leftists, all of the liberals, uh, all agreed that Italy should be unified, as opposed to the devout Catholics, who thought that the existence of the Papal States it was, in fact, a good thing. So there were two, but even among those who wanted Italy to be unified, as uh, uh, really as a vehicle of revolution to some extent, uh, there were different ideas as to what exactly, what exactly what form that should take. So you may remember the, the school of Vincenzo Gioberti, uh, who had this idea that Italy should become a kind of confederation with the Pope as effectively a president, just sitting on top of the whole thing as, as something of a figurehead, and uh, everybody would be happy with that. That was the the milder version of it, really taking away effectively all temporal power from the Pope, but having him sit on top of the whole thing as a kind of president. Uh, and the Mazzini's idea was the more radical one, that everything, everything should just be taken away from the Pope and everything should just be forged into this Freemasonic kingdom of Italy, which was the version that in fact won out in the end. That's what happened. Everything was just taken away from the Holy See, ultimately. So. Um, while Pius IX was in exile, Marc Antonio Pacelli complemented the efforts of Cardinal Antonelli, who arranged for foreign assistance to implement the Pope's restoration and the reestablishment of the Papal States. So they were theoretically abolished, the Papal States, during the Revolution of 1848, but were, as, uh, as we just said, reestablished once Pius IX himself was reinstalled in Rome to his rightful place there. So it was the diplomatic maneuvering of the Cardinal, Cardinal Antonelli, that led to the military intervention of the Catholic powers who orchestrated the collapse of the Roman Republic brought about by the Papal Restoration of 1849. So this restoration did indeed happen. The Papal States were brought back. At that point, in theory, everything was back to normal and everything was good again. Uh, the Sardinians, again, this was not done, you know, this, as we said earlier, the Sardinians eventually ended up seizing Rome completely. Uh, they were not openly involved in, in the revolution of 1848 in Rome itself, but they were already even then distrusted both by Pius IX, by Pio Nono, and his chief minister. Uh, they were not invited to participate in either the military intervention or the political restoration uh, because they correctly uh, suspected that the Turin government sought territorial expansion in the peninsula at the expense of the Papal States. That is precisely what they were doing. That is precisely what they were after. And the Pius IX clearly, and definitely we can say in retrospect, was correct to distrust them. So the Marc Antonio uh, his, was uh, very much in the camp of Pius IX this entire time very, very definitely opposed to any kind of reduction, or certainly the elimination, but even to any kind of reduction of the temporal power of the papacy in Italy over the papal states. Uh, and uh, remember that it was typical of liberals to say, oh, well, the church should be free of all of that, 
uh, should be free of all the, 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 the concerns, the temporal concerns of having to rule over territories um, and should just focus on the spiritual side of things. That's what, the, that's what the liberals of the day were saying. The implication being, therefore, the church should just give up all of that property and all those territories, which is nonsense for so many reasons. Uh, but yeah, for one thing, the church has a human side to it, obviously. has a human aspect to it that needs the support, uh, uh, material support, in order to carry out its operations, just as any ordinary human organization needs. You know, the church is not an ordinary human organization. Of course, it is a divinely instituted organization, but it, it does have a human side to it that needs human resources. So that's utter nonsense just for that reason. But even if the reasoning of those liberals were correct, which it's not, even if that were correct, the conclusion that therefore we can just go and take that property from the church is still a grave violation of the Seventh Commandment. <laughs> There's no doubt of that whatsoever. And that's exactly what happened. And at certain points, Pius IX was urged, oh, maybe you should just give up these, these states. You, might, you should just give it up to us. And the, the answer was, well, it's not mine to give up. It was referred to as the patrimony of St. Peter, as uh, uh, these territories belong to the Holy See. And every pope who ruled, or of course reigned over the Catholic Church, also ruled over the papal states as the temporal ruler, as effectively the king of the papal states. Uh, that he was, just as any other temporal ruler, uh, has to defend the integrity of his territory. And who would go up to uh, any other civil ruler, a king or a president or whatever, any, any kind of uh, grand ruler, and tell him, well, why don't you just start giving up territory to us? Why, why, why don't you just do that? It would be a good idea. It would be good for you to do that. That, that makes absolutely, obviously, no, no. What temporal ruler in his right mind would ever agree to that? So also... Pius IX, why would anybody be surprised that Pius IX would refuse in exactly the same manner? Even more so, because this ultimately that's for the support of the church, which man, provides for the supernatural good of the souls uh, that are members of it. Rather, well, of course, ultimately the idea is that the church wants to do everything it can to provide for the salvation of the entire human race. So it's even, even more so in that respect as well. Uh, does the church have title to its territories and resources? Its mission being more, much more important than that of the, of the state, which is not unimportant by any means, but that of the, the, the church provides for the eternal good of souls, whereas the state, the function of the state is to provide for the temporal good of its citizens so that they may more easily provide for their eternal welfare. In a correctly ordered nation, that is the setup. That uh, church and state are indeed united, but they are uh, one. The state uh, is, is subordinate, very definitely subordinate to the church uh, in, in that way. And in the grand scheme of things, the church is indeed more important than the state. You know, they are two separate, they're not, uh, they're, they're two separate uh, entities, but they are meant to be united and to be functioning. Uh, they are uh, together. Uh, in accordance, uh, in perfect harmony with, with each other. And this uh, holds true even though, of course, yes, they are, there are certain areas in which only the church operates, certain areas in which only the state operates. Uh, the church is not going to um, wage the wars of the nation, for example, nor is the, the state going to decide um, uh, various different points of purely ecclesiastical discipline for the church. But there was definitely, uh, there, there definitely ought to be, and there, there was in many of the uh, nations of, of, certainly of, of medieval Catholic Europe, a true union of church and state. In, in, in Western Europe in the Middle Ages was correctly ordered. Uh, the, not to say that it was, everything was perfectly free of problems the whole time, but everything was, you could say, basically correctly ordered. And... Uh, that was uh, very good. The, the church definitely approved of that situation, which started to fall apart later on. Uh, then that, all of that is definitely outside of our scope here. Uh, but uh, the, the point we're making here is that uh, the, the church definitely has title to territories and resources just as uh, any ordinary human organization has title to it. So Mark Antonio's ardor in resisting the demands of the nationalist-inspired liberals pleased Pius IX, 
who in 1851 appointed him Under Secretary of State in the Ministry of the Interior, a post he held for some two decades. So for both uh, religious and economic purposes, the elders of the Pacelli family steadfastly refused to recognize the Italian kingdom's incorporation of the Papal States. And this was really you know, in accordance with, in fact, uh, the, uh, the positions of the popes themselves from Pius IX all the way up through Pius XI, uh, during whose reign the Pacellis became very much involved in the negotiation of the Lateran Accords. They were very much involved in the negotiations that resulted in the Lateran Accords of 1929. Because during those times, well, we have it right here, the total loss of the Vatican's temporal power from 1860 to 1870 had fiscal as well as political and religious implications so that those who served it could not be and were not highly paid. Again, the loss of the papal states entailed a tremendous loss of resources for the church, and that meant that anybody who remained faithful to the Holy See in that time, or subsequent to it, you know, necessarily suffered in a, in a material way as well. All right, so the, further down you have it in the notes that Marco Antonio Pacelli abstained from any contact with the Italian authorities who seized Rome from papal control. And this was true, again, of the popes themselves for many decades uh, during the reign of Pius IX, of, of Leo XIII, St. Pius X, Benedict XV. During all that time, uh, there, uh, there, was no, there was not a recognition of the Italian state. Uh, it was, there was always this idea that we will eventually get back the papal states. And for a long time, even the supposed king of Italy uh, was referred to as the Duke of Savoy by, by the popes. Because the idea is that this is, he's not the king of Italy, he's just the duke of some, of some place in, in, uh, somewhere north of us who's just a squatter in our territory. These people are just sitting there and uh, sitting in the Quirinal Palace, which what used to be the residence of the popes. They took over the Quirinal Palace. And the idea was that he's just, he's just sitting there. Uh, we don't know why he's there, but the Duke of Savoy is just sitting there for some reason. And in fact, they would refuse to see, uh, St. Pius X did this, uh, he refused to receive former uh, President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, because Theodore Roosevelt had, uh, was also going to go visit the King of Italy. So if you're going to visit him, don't even come anywhere near me. I'm not going to be seen as uh, uh, someone you can visit alongside to just here's the, the church and the temporal ruler. Uh, we're not going to be seen uh, as, as, as being some kind of, in some situation in which we agree to that, agree to being received either before uh, or agreeing to receive some visitor either before or after the, uh, the, uh, the state, uh, the supposed uh, government of the Kingdom of Italy. So, uh, not so, however, uh, Filippo Pacelli, Eugenio's father, eventually he, that is Filippo, and other members of the family, pragmatically abandoned Marc Antonio's strict intransigence and came to terms with the new Italian state. Uh, and this is all in, in spite of the fact that they were definitely very firmly classified as blacks, part of the so-called black nobility, very much in favor of the papacy. But they eventually started to soften. Mark Antonio himself was always intransigent on that, but his, his son and, and his grandsons all began to soften with the idea that well, this is here to stay. Uh, what are we going to do about it? Uh, we can't get rid of it. We, can't, we cannot bring back the papal states. We would if we could, but it's just impossible. So what are we going to do? And we'll see just how quickly, in fact, they went from being you see that from the intransigence of Marco Antonio Pacelli to the uh, really uh, you know, quite a very fact, uh, a very, uh, very great softness on the part of Pius XII, uh, not only personally but even as Pope during his reign. So Francesco Pacelli, Eugenio's older brother, negotiated the Lateran Accords of 1929, which uh, included a treaty, a concordat, and financial settlement with Mussolini's Italy. So not, not just uh, any Italian government, but Benito Mussolini himself. You know, Mussolini, who is who is named for the revolutionary Benito Juarez. Remember that that's the Spanish version of the name. The Italian is Benedetto. 
It was named Benito, the, uh, the, the Spanish version of the name, because his father was such a revolutionary and had such an admiration for the revolutionary Benito Juarez that he named his son Benito. We, co we covered some of uh, Mussolini's highly, highly colorful uh, personal character and uh, extremely immoral life uh, last year. And we, and we may touch on that, some of that again, though that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves. But indeed, it, that's, that was... Uh, what happened just in the course of you know, just that number of years uh, from the reign of Pius IX to that of Pius XI, the Pacilli family went from being very hardline to being, uh, you need to negotiate with what's there. So it led to the sovereignty of the Vatican City and played a key role in the reconciliation, in some sense, between the Vatican and the Italian state. Again, definitely after that time, uh, the Italian state was recognized by the church. So that was during the reign of Pius XI. You know, the idea was, well, after so many years, and from 1870 up until the 1920s, there clearly nothing. There was no progress being made towards restoring the papal states. So the idea was, well, maybe it's time to come to terms with, with the thing that's there, whether we like it or not. So the Pacellis uh, retained their devotion to the papacy, although with the passage of time, they were reconciled to the loss of much of the papal state, or perhaps resigned might be a better word to use there. They did so without challenging Marc Antonio, who continued to hope for a second restoration. So uh, Marc Antonio, the, uh, the grandfather of Pius XII, never gave up that hope. Even though it was never realized, but he never gave it up. Eugenio himself was baptized quickly, just two days after his birth, by his paternal uh, uncle, Don Giuseppe Pacelli, in the parish church of Santi Celso at uh, Giuliano at the Via del Banco San Spirito. This celerity was particularly important in Eugenio's case, for as an infant, he was judged less than healthy. So, uh, in fact, uh, this is, this, uh, the, the, the reason for that was given by Pius XII himself as Pope uh, in a famous uh, address to midwives that he gave at a certain point, in which he mentioned that it, it is important that midwives know how to baptize because that that's the only chance that the soul of the infant has before it reaches the age of reason. If it dies before reaching the age of reason, its only possibility for eternal salvation is to receive the actual sacrament of baptism. Of course, baptism of desire is, a, is impossible for uh, the soul of an infant. So, uh, yeah, Pius XII himself pointed that out. And uh, he himself, he said, was baptized just two days after his birth because of poor health. He was... He was someone who was always, was always um, personally frail, uh, uh, Pius XII. And he, he lived and reigned for a long time, but he was, uh, 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 he was prone to physical maladies. He had the hiccups for, for a long time, for example. He sought various different remedies for that, but uh, he was, even as an infant, judged less than healthy. So normally, yes, a baptism should, it shouldn't be put off unnecessarily, but this was done very quickly because there was the possibility that he might die, uh, which is correct, uh, but that is definitely the, the correct course of action to take. We could get into all of, all of that, uh, the situations in which uh, an infant uh, is to be baptized, uh, you know, even if the parents uh, don't want it, that only, only in the case of an infant who's about to die uh, is that permissible. Otherwise, you end up with cases like the Mortara affair, which uh, we covered a couple of years ago, we won't go into now but you end up with cases like that, which was then a baby who was a baptized Catholic in a Jewish family. What you do with that? Pius IX had the baby taken out of the family and raised elsewhere. So you end up with situations like that. And that such a situation would be impossible now, uh, it'd be impossible to, to remove a child from such a family today. That was when the papal states were still in existence and the Pope was the temporal ruler and could do that. Uh, but uh, today, that'd be impossible. So. That, that's a very interesting story all on its own, but that's not something that uh, we are focusing on now. Uh, the, uh, there have been claims at times that the family's influence, and most notably their role in the counter risorgimento and intransigent defense of the temporal power of the papacy, taken up combatively by the Pacelli elders, later led Eugenio to shun confrontation and conflict, which seemed to him to be counterproductive. And this reflects really the reason why you have that, 
pendulating papacy that we mentioned before, that every time a pope committed to one or the other school of thought, we'll say, uh, would uh, have his reign and uh, his policies might have bad effects in some cases, things would not turn out as expected. Uh, everybody would get the idea, okay, that didn't work, let's try something else. Let's go for somebody of the opposite school of thought. And so somebody else would be elected. And that's what happened, again, reign of uh, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth thing, there were, there were problems during that reign. Or, uh, and then Pius the Ninth, uh, Mastai Ferretti, was very soft and very liberal at the time. Uh, he was elected in reaction to that, and then ended up becoming himself very hardline when he realized that that doesn't work. But then Leo the Thirteenth, I know, see all the disasters that befell the church during the reign of Pius the Ninth, to which a uh, young uh, Eugenio Pacelli, probably uh, seeing the effects of, probably reacted to, personally, uh, in a, very much in accordance with his uh, clearly um, uh, his personal inclinations, and then in reaction to Pius IX, Pope Leo the Thirteenth elected as the soft line candidate. Following that, Saint Pius the Tenth, very hard line, and it continues to go back and forth. So, uh, we saw we saw quite a bit of that last year, but yeah, you know, this was very much the. Uh, what may have been going through uh, uh, the mind of the young Eugenio Pacelli with regard to the conduct of his elders uh, in, this, in his own family uh, was, may well have been something along the lines of the general thinking that led to the election of first a candidate from one faction of, of candidates uh, then to the other. So uh, one, one with that today, but right now we really we're setting the stage. We're looking at Pius XII personally, family background. We'll continue that next time. Domine Patris et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Subtum Presidium Confugimus, Sancta Regeni Trix, Nos Horsti Precaciones et Espicias, In Necessitatibus, Terra Periclis Cunctis Libera Nos Semper, Virgo Corios et Benedicta. Amen. Domine Patris et Fili, et Spiritus Sancti, Amen.